Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I just see that my name says Brad Fitch. I think I clicked the wrong link. Let me log out and come okay. in with my link. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Brad. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm sorry if you were having trouble logging in um, or interpreter accidentally used your link to log in, but should be all set now. Hello. Hello. Hi, Brad. Hello. How are you? Doing great. Good. Let me get my PowerPoint ready. What is your name, Hispanic Access? Oh, this is Karina. We've been um, I, in emails back and I, forth, Natalia. Yes, I'm Karina. Nice to hot. meet you maybe, formally. Maybe I don't recognize you with your wet hair, or have we seen each other before on a Zoom? I don't think so. No, maybe I don't really do tech too much. Well, hi, Karina. Nice to see you. And you're so I'm using... just going to go ahead and test uh, sharing my screen. Should be able to see that. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, so as you can see, Natalia, uh, all the PowerPoint slides have been converted by Hispanic Access into Spanish, but there are a couple of videos that are not in Spanish. Um, okay. I don't know how you want to handle just sort of, are you going to be doing simultaneous or is it going to be sequential? No, simultaneous. So uh, you're in a different I, channel. I should, be, I should be on my own channel, Karina, um, eventually. Um, and I will... I think I accidentally started the interpretation, so um, I don't think I can hear you anymore, Natalia. Let me switch it. Can you mind talking? No. Um, one sec. Thanks. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. So, so I switched to the English channel for a second. Could you hear me? Uh, Brad? He can't hear me? Brad, can you hear um, Natalia? No, I cannot. Oh, you can't, you can't hear me now? If you, um, Brad, if you click on the English um, at the bottom screen, it's right on the right of Ray's hand. Got it, I'm there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, yeah. um, then if you would like for the videos, I could just translate as the video goes. Yeah, they're both um, about uh, 60 seconds long. Perfect. So they're just staff members talking about how things work. I will also do my best despite my natural enthusiasm to talk slowly. <laughs> Don't worry, Brad, I've been with you before. Yeah, okay, I thought so. so. Yeah, I'll do my best. I need to turn on my speedy my speedy brain yeah I, I'll, I'll do it no but i love this and this is the third one um i i should be very transparent i have uh just an unusual my board uh one third of my board are uh latino women and yeah. so i was able to email them over the weekend and said i've got my third translation in spanish you know which is great for a kid who like literally failed spanish three times in high school so you know this is really yeah <laughs> When I saw that when I saw that your slides were were translated, I was like, "Phew." <laughs> well, yeah, the Hispanic Access Foundation has a volunteer who's done this and uh, before, and in fact, I'm going to be presenting tomorrow at their conference in Washington. They'll be having a presentation I've done before on storytelling, and they've actually even gotten subtitles in for the videos. So, oh wait, so the presentation today is not the storytelling? No, it's no. not. Is, is it the one of how to create an event? It is. Okay, so I've got those slides too. Okay, perfect. Okay. And I, I am also in Washington, so I will see you tomorrow. Oh, great. Yeah, cool. All right, well, I think I'm good. Um, I need to switch myself back into the Spanish channel. So when I do that, Karina, will you just um, sound check me on the interp line, please? Yep, will do. Okay, okay thank you. And um, you're going to be great, Brad, as always. Enjoy. <laughs>
Um, yeah, Brad, so I'll take myself off the screen basically, and I'm just going to make sure that she works, but I'll just be handling the tech behind the scenes. I'll basically be off camera and kind of in the background, but do you have any questions? Yes. Will you introduce me or should I introduce myself? Um, do you mind introducing yourself? I, I, I didn't realize you didn't have a moderator for this event. Okay. Then I'll stay off camera until uh, one o'clock. Okay. Sounds good. Let me know when you can hear me on the you can hear I'm me on the Spanish. Internet? yeah Perfect. okay um and i'm going to be off camera too so if you'll let brad know like during the during his talk i'll be off camera um yeah that sounds perfect natalia he's off camera too so i'm basically starting it at one but i think we're good perfect okay gracias thank you
Brad, I'm starting now. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Hispanic Access Foundation and presented by the Congressional Management Foundation. My name is Brad Fitch. I'm president and CEO of the Congressional Management Foundation, and I'm delighted to be back with Hispanic Access Foundation to present our research and content on how you can build better relationships, understandings, and communications with the United States Congress and with state and local lawmakers. Today's topic is how to create an event that will attract a member of Congress. Now, the title says member of Congress, but the information and advice we're gonna share with you today is good for any elected official. You know, attracting an elected official to an event, whether it's a church or some other kind of activity, is actually a lot easier than you think on some levels. There are rules and procedures that every elected official follows and if you know what those are in advance and you can kind of fit into their uniform, their forms, their plan and actually connect with them on their issues, they're going to come to your event and it's going to increase your visibility. But equally important, it's going to increase their understanding of what you're doing to serve the community and how the decisions that they make affect people in a very real way. So I earlier introduced myself as Brad Fitch, president and CEO of the Congressional Management Foundation. We're one of the vendors and partners that works with the Hispanic Access Foundation. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit, the only one that spends 100% of its money and resources and people dedicated to improving the United States Congress and its relationship with constituents. I've been in working in and around the Congress for 36 years, including 13 years as a staff member, 
in the House and Senate. I've worked at the Congressional Management Foundation on and off for 17 years, 12 as the president and CEO. And I'm delighted again to present this contact again to the Hispanic Access Foundation. Along the way, just a little housekeeping. If you want to go ahead and ask a question, you can ask it in the Q&A box or the chat box. They'll both light up for me. So feel free to make this as interactive as possible. And of course, um, we are doing this in two languages. So if I'm talking in a little bit halting uh, language, I'm just allowing our interpreter to stay up with me because as I told her before we were in the waiting room, my natural inclination is a little too enthusiastic. So I'm going to try to move it down to third gear instead of fifth gear uh, for y'all today. Okay, let's jump right into today's content and share with you the research and the advice that the Congressional Management Foundation has developed over the years for creating events that elected officials will attend. This great quote you've probably heard many times, all politics is local. It is a truism that elected officials understand that their power and indeed their rights to serve in privilege, to serve in office comes from constituents. And in fact, when you talk to members of Congress and staff and ask them how they interact with uh, constituents and with other groups, they would much rather talk to you as a constituent than for example, a lobbyist or someone representing you. Here is one survey data point the Congressional Management Foundation collected in a survey of congressional staff. We asked this question, finish this sentence. The member of Congress to per prefers to have meetings with constituent groups where? And the number one answer was no preference at all. I know that a lot of people think that Washington is the end all be all. And I know some of you uh, may even be considering coming to Washington, D.C. Uh, as part of this event tomorrow. And, and, and some of you may be there. But the point is that while that is valuable and obviously important for building relationships with the Washington staff and the member of Congress, it is equally important that you consider a strategy back home, that when the legislator is back in the district or state, that you create an event or at least even a meeting opportunity that they are going to want to attend. One other survey question we asked that demonstrates the value of this went like this. When your member is trying to be visible throughout the district, how important are the following activities? And the number one answer at important was site visits, 95% so this was important. I have no idea who the 4% were that said unimportant. I don't know if they still have jobs in Congress, but they're certainly not the staff I work with. Most people will report that site visits or any type of activity where frankly, they can get themselves photographed with regular people instead of other politicians is something that's going to be very attractive to that elected official. Let me drill down a little deeper and share with you a little more data on what these visits look like. In one of our surveys of congressional schedulers, we asked this question, approximately how often does your member personally participate in the following events and activities when in the district or state? And as you can see here, they're doing two site visits on a monthly or a weekly basis. This is something that is a staple for elected officials. Now, of course, during the pandemic, members of Congress didn't do that. But as the country has started to reopen, and certainly the Congress has started to reopen, they're doing that more and more. One congressional staffer said this, constituents should be reminded they can meet with the member in the district office at any time. Often in DC, meetings get disrupted more than we'd like by votes. Meetings can go awry and wind up only being able to meet with staff. So this is another piece of advice that even staffers are telling you that you can go back into the district office and spend time with them if you like. Oh, I saw somebody's camera came out. I was just trying to see if somebody had a question, but if that's not the case, I'll, I'll keep going. Okay, let me jump into the agenda here today and what we're gonna be covering here. Um, first, we're gonna talk about the value of in-state interactions and go into a little more research there, how the scheduling process works and deconstruct a successful event, meaning we will actually show you some actual event and we can provide you some more resources, handouts, if you wish, that will show you a little bit more of the value and how to put together an event. So let's get kicked off with why what we call staycation advocacy. Why is that important? Well, one staff member said it like this, Nothing replaces face-to-face -face interacting with staff. It matters less whether the meeting is with state staff or with DC staff, and more important, and we could sit down and talk with someone. 
once again, as you've seen, if you've been in any of our other presentations, our research shows that relationship building is the key to modern advocacy. Groups that go in and just once a year interact with the lawmaker or maybe don't build those relationships with the state and local staff or the DC staff are just not going to be as effective as groups like yours that are going to make the effort to get to know that person. Every one of you should probably be able to get to know someone in a House member's district office and senator's state offices. It may not be the most senior person in that uh, office, but every one of those offices have someone with the title of either field representative district director, or even state director or regional director, depending upon the Senate uh, size of the state in the Senate. Those people are there for you, and they're interested in getting to know you and learning about your issues that you're advocating on behalf of the Hispanic Access Foundation or for some other local group that you are connected to. Okay, let me show you, for example, another survey question we had when we ask how important was the following. When your member is trying to develop new ideas for issues and legislation. How important are the following activities? And what we found out, not surprisingly, was as follows. That as you can see at the top of the list, meetings with community leaders, meetings with constituents, meetings with interest group representatives. By the way, that's every one of the people in this webinar today. And by the way, while interest group may be a dirty phrase or word in the rest of America, inside the Beltway, it's not. I mean, I know I sometimes hear the term special interest groups, and I reply, you mean you're talking about teachers or farmers or pastors? I mean, you're all so-called special interests, and while the media may have made you out to be some sort of villain, we know that this is the bulk of who is interacting with Congress. It's not corporate lobbyists. It's actually constituents and constituent groups and people that represent them. But let's drill down a little further. What is Congress looking for when they interact with you? Well, this is what we found out. They want to know what actions you want to take. They want to know why constituents want me to do that. They want to know what are the current and or potential local impacts. They want it localized in some way. And localization could be the number of people that are affected by it. Um, it can be an economic impact. Um, I mean, just think about what is the economic impact of somebody getting a job? Obviously, that means they're going to be a taxpayer. So they're looking to have it localized in some ways. And if there's any personal story connected to the uh, issue or to the policy, I'll be doing a training program in Washington for Hispanic Access Foundation on storytelling tomorrow. And the reason is, for a couple of reasons, actually, one is our research shows that storytelling is the most powerful tool in an advocate's toolkit. Because as human beings, we react better to emotional stories rather than rational arguments. I know a lot of people like to think that human beings are rational thinking beings. But one neuroscientist summed it up best. He said, we are not thinking beings. We are emotional beings that occasionally think. And that's members of Congress, believe it or not, are human beings. And they're the same way. So if you have story of a parishioner or yourself, or your family member, or somebody else that you want to communicate. And it can be an immigration story. It can be a uh, environmental story. It, it really, what's important is that it's real people affiliated with that particular issue. I'll give you one example of where I saw this happen, where a, a person told a very short story that really affected that member of Congress. There was a member I was working with some years ago and in interviewing for a book I was writing, and he, I asked him, tell me about a difficult decision that you had to make. And he said, well, I was kind of torn on whether to support federal funding for stem cell research, very controversial issue. And he told me how he met with a 17-year-old boy and from his district. And the 17-year-old boy named Philip said, Congressman, I have juvenile diabetes. It's my hope that this research someday might lead to a cure to me or others like me. And when I was interviewing the member of Congress, he leaned into me and said, that meeting just stuck with me. And he told me how he did further research on the issue. He ended up co-sponsoring legislation that would provide federal funding for stem cell research. And that member of Congress was a pro-life Republican. 
Now, I'm not saying you can turn every no to a yes with a story, but if you don't have a story, you don't have a chance. So think about what story you're going to tell and how that's going to fit into the policy narrative for that member of Congress. Okay, let's continue on. There's some more research on, on site visits and when members of Congress uh, actually go to district or state. One of the questions we asked was, how long do they spend at a site visit? And what we found out was actually quite a long time, that they're anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. And I know that sounds amazing that a member of Congress is going to spend an hour or two. But once they've made that initial investment to drive to a location, they actually kind of want to stay at least 45 minutes to an hour. It might be a little briefer. In Washington, you know, those meetings are sometimes 15 minutes long. A member of Congress on average in Washington has 13 meetings a day. That's average. On a bad day, it's 18 meetings a day. But when they're in the district, they actually have a much more leisurely time and they want to interact with constituents. So let's touch on this. And I also want to talk about uh, for a second, uh, the value of a virtual visit because it's both in-person and virtual these days. Now, I know that, you know, like many people and probably like you in April of 2020, three years ago around now, I was not embracing virtual life. I was scared to death. I was scared for my family. I live with my 92-year-old father-in-law. We were all worried about this. But now that we've all settled into a post-pandemic world, it's clear to the Congressional Management Foundation that adding virtual to a citizen advocate's toolkit is the most valuable enhancement to citizen engagement since the invention of email. It's that big a deal. So as you think about those things you're going to do, think about whether there's a virtual component that you are going to add. And people do virtual site visits where people will just literally walk around with a camera and turn it on and just show the member of Congress, here's my parishioners, here's my church, here's some of the activities that we're doing, here's a quick talk to this person right there. It's a virtual component. So when you want to think about a virtual component, consider a few things. One, are you going to alert the media? Are they going to be participating uh, in this virtual session? Um, are you going to use social media to amplify that and tell people in advance through social media, through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Um, are there any, um, uh, uh, one, we want you to consider, uh, sorry, got a little lost here in my presentation. Um, or you want to, are you going to record the session? That's a really big deal for a member of Congress. If they're going to uh, record the session, that's something they're going to want to know about in advance because um, they'll be a little more circumspect on talking. And are there any legal pitfalls that they have to take into consideration? You know, sometimes when you're doing uh, legal stuff or you're doing health stuff, you have to consider the HIPAA law. So think about attracting your audience to a particular event. Um, so are you going to, how will the event um, be promoted in advanced. Um, you want to also consider the congressional calendar. Let me take a minute and talk about the congressional calendar because this is probably one of the most important details that you're going to want to focus on when you're planning an event with an elected official. So every year, the House and Senate publish a calendar. It's really easy to find. You literally Google House of Representatives calendar and you'll find this PDF document which has the schedule. Now, this particular year, under Majority Leader Steve Scalise of Louisiana, they did a couple of unusual things to the calendar that they haven't done before. First, they've added more two-week recesses. So, for example, next Monday will be beginning of a two-week Easter recess. It's a little too late to schedule an event. Um, our research shows that you want to put in a request about three to four weeks out. I think four weeks is kind of the sweet spot of getting a request in. But then we have a two-week recess in May. We've never had a two-week recess around Memorial Day. We have a two-week recess for July 4th. We have a six-week recess for August. And then we have another week and a half recess, I believe, in late October. But if you pull open the congressional calendar, you're going to see all this. Why is that important? Well, if you're going to try to do an event with the member of Congress back home, you're going to want to know what their schedule is. And if you're working in a congressional office about four weeks before a big recess, you're taking a look as a staff member at who's invited us and stuff. But more importantly, what do you want to be proactive and do? So if they're members of Congress, but let's say I work with a member, a Republican from uh, Southern Virginia, and he's on the Armed Services Committee. 
And so they're always thinking about opportunities to go to military facilities in the district. Okay, then they've decided to go to that facility. What else is near there? And they look at their scheduling quests and say, has someone invited us to do something near Norfolk, you know, or, or some other facility that they're going to be going to? So you get the idea is like if you're trying to think about the connection to that elected official about four weeks out, but if you know the congressional calendar and then when you put your request in, and we'll talk about this in a few more minutes in more detail, you want to be as flexible as possible. If you give a state or federal lawmaker a specific date, and sometimes you may have an event, right? Cinco de Mayo happens once a year. <laughs> it's got to be on Cinco de Mayo. But if you have a broader window, if you say in that request, sometime during the May recess, would you come and have a meeting? If, if they ignore you. You kind of know where you stand with that office, but they also may ask a staff member to attend. But again, you're going to want to know in advance what that calendar is. So again, just Google House calendar or House of Representatives calendar and you'll find out. And then we're going to go into more detail to describe, to understand the member's scheduling process. I'm going to actually touch on that in a few minutes in much more detail because that's going to be a real helpful tool for you to make requests of that member of Congress. Okay, once again, um, uh, I want to just uh, emphasize you can ask questions in the chat. I think we've got some chat going on here. So let me just take a look. It just welcomes here. I haven't seen anything yet. Thank you for putting it in English. You're looking at a man who failed Spanish three times in high school. Just one of those skills I just never could pick up. But so I'm delighted we have a translator here today because I would be uh, pretty unable to do this. Okay. Well, let's continue on. I don't see we have any questions yet, but please feel free to drop a question in there or in the uh, Q&A box as well, because that's another place that um, I can look at if I can pull up the Q&A box someplace around here. Maybe it will. Okay. Well, there it is. Okay. Oops. This started too fast. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself here. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to share with you a, a video right now of a senior staff member who's going to be talking about the importance of in-district activities and in-district events. And as I said earlier, this is something that members of Congress are looking for, but this staff member really pulls it all together. Let's, let's watch this video together. Uh, people oftentimes think that uh, by scheduling a meeting in Washington, D.C., it adds importance. Uh, you will get a longer time with the member if you do it back home in the district, in the state. Uh, you'll have a better opportunity to visit with them because they're uh, not going to be distracted by votes or staff or emails or phone calls. Um, you're going to have dedicated time to take that meeting in the district. And if you bring somebody on site to show the impact of what your company, your business, your nonprofit, your food bank, whatever it is, what they're doing at home to affect your local community, and there are other people in the room that are your workers, your volunteers, your employees, whatever they are, and how they're impacted, uh, and then to tie that to a specific policy or specific federal action that is impacting you, that member is going to pay attention. And the important part of my end is that we then communicate between the people in the district and the people in Washington, D.C. to make sure that action is taken. I wish every one of my interviews went that well with Charlie. He was a great, he's a good friend and, and did really captured it perfectly about the importance. And do you hear how he said bring other people to the meeting? Um, that's really valuable. I mean, in the district, that's the thing you have the advantage of. In Washington, you can fit maybe three people in the average house member's office building room uh, in their DC office. But in the district, many of them have conference tables and you want to have a meeting at the district office they can accommodate six or seven people. If you want to bring them to a church or another location, obviously you've got a lot more potential there. And when you start getting 10 or 12 or 15 people for a house member, that's really attractive. You know, they love talking to groups. They're politicians, right? They just love interacting with groups of people. So it's a really good advantage um, for you to do that. And by the way, our data shows that they very much want to get those requests from constituents. One survey we asked senior staff, our office would prefer to receive a request for a meeting with the member from the following individual. And again, no surprise that the vast majority said a constituent instead of a Washington representative. Now, if the group is well known to the member of Congress, um, that's a little different. They're okay having the Washington representative set up the meeting. But 
if you're a constituent, it's an opportunity for you to build a relationship with that office, with the scheduler, and then a staff member who is setting that up. Uh, one staff member said this, our number one factor in scheduling a meeting is if a constituent is in the group. Uh, one of the things we strongly discourage you from doing is don't do a bait and switch. Don't promise a constituent will be there and then not have someone there. Now, you may be an individual, uh, if you're involved in a church where the church is in one member's district and you live in another, that's okay. If the church is in that district, if you live in the district, both in the minds of that politician, state or federal, they're going to view both of that as a constituency um, because that's important to them. And do not underestimate the power of, of, of using your church name or the parishioners that are involved in that, because that's something that they're going to listen to. We do a couple um, work with a couple of religious groups, groups, including Catholic Relief Services. And, you know, they'll request a meeting with a member of Congress and say flat out, we've got 300 constituents in this church that are interested in this issue. All right. I'm a politician. You got my attention. You're going to tell your story to 300 people. That's a lot of people. So keep that in mind, that connection to constituency. Now, um, let me go into a little more detail on the timing of this. One of the questions we asked our schedulers in our survey went like this. For each of the following activities, how many weeks in advance should the request be made for the member to personally participate? So this is really the kind of granular data you're going to want. So if they're doing a parade or a festival or they're doing a formal speech like a graduation ceremony, they're going to want five to six weeks. That's a bigger deal. But if they're having a meeting, in the district or a site visit, as I said, four weeks is the magical number. And I say just because what staff tell us, if you do it more than four weeks, like eight weeks out, they don't have a clue what they're going to be doing during that time. If you do it less than three weeks, the schedule has already started to cement itself. I worked for four years, five years rather, in the United States Senate as the communications director for a United States senator. And I can tell you folks, like clockwork, three to four weeks out, I would have my conference call on the upcoming recess with the scheduler and the state director. And the three of us would basically plan. The first thing we plan is what are the media hits we want? What are the photo opportunities we want? And then, okay, if we're going to be in Rochester or Poughkeepsie or Syracuse, who do we want to be seen with? And we plan it out that way. And then when we knew we were going to be in Rochester or Syracuse, we then would plan, okay, who else in that community has made a request to meet with us? Because they generally want to say yes to you in general, as you probably heard me say, uh, one member of, of Congress said to me that their DNI or DNA hardwired to say yes to you. They're politicians. One member of Congress said, she said, I think all members of Congress are middle children trying to please their father. And that is absolutely true. I mean, so they're going to want to try to find a way to say yes to you. And oh, by the way, um, if it's something really immediate, like a press conference, that, that is something that they will um, they will immediately respond to. Now, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a confusing infographic here, but this is going to be the process by which every congressional office makes its decision. I talked to you a little bit about the process in the Senate office I worked in, and I'll talk a little bit about the procedures in a minute in the actual forms they use. But first, let me walk you through what the process looks like. So first, you're going to be putting in a scheduling request, some kind of scheduling request that's going to say, I want to meet with the lawmaker at this particular time or this window of time, right? They then review that particular material and the scheduler determines whether or not it has all the information they need to make a decision. Is there a cell phone number? Do we know the name of the group? Have they given us a list of perhaps some constituents who might participate? In some cases, they're going to determine that the information is incomplete. They will either decline the request and say no, or they'll actually request more information because they say this is a group we maybe want to review of. Once they are complete, that they know that they have the information is complete and they know that they have all the data that they need to make a decision, that's when it goes into a process that is reviewed by senior staff. Remember, I told you I got involved after the scheduler had that information with the state director for the U.S. senator and the communications director. We were the ones that determined the recess schedule. By the way, the one person who was not involved in determining his schedule was the United States senator. That is all handled by staff. Those events that they attend, the decisions that they make is all handled by staff. Again, 
At some point, they may decide to decline that invitation because for whatever reason, or they may just say to send staff to go to that event, or they may decide to approve that invitation. At that point in the process, they're then going to start working with you on the details. If the member is going to arrive, where's the right entrance for the member to arrive? Who is going to greet them? Who are the other people that are going to be there? Who is going to get photographed with that member of Congress? These level of details are important to have at the ready. So when they make that request that, or they make that affirmation that they're going to attend. Now, the next uh, person I want to bring on, another rock star staffer of ours is uh, Jordan Wilson. He used to work for Representative uh, Rob Whitman as the scheduler and office manager. And we interviewed Jordan to talk a little bit about how the process worked in his office. And let's listen into what he said. The most helpful way from a scheduling standpoint that a constituent or a group is to have as much information in your initial meeting request as possible um, because that saves so much back and forth over email or phone tag um, and it just consolidates the process. And so um, on our website, I think like most members of Congress, we have an appearance request form and a meeting request form. And a lot of constituents and even outside groups think that you can just come straight to me and just say, hey, I'm going to be there Thursday. Does this time work? And although I want to accommodate, um, I can't put something on the calendar that I have no information about. So let me just reiterate and amplify something that Jordan said. You heard him reference a scheduling form on members' websites. When you go to the website, the form is usually behind the contact us button. And every member of Congress has a contact us button. If they have a scheduling form on the website, then it'll be there under the contact us button. Now they may not. In that case, if you don't see it on the website, here's what I coach you to do. Call the district office, the local district office of that member of Congress or that set legislator and simply say, I want to invite the member of Congress to an event where I'd like to request a meeting with the member of Congress. Those are code words to everyone answering the phone. So they'll either send you to a website section or they'll give you an email address that's like scheduler MD03 for the third district of Maryland at mail.house.gov or be ready for this. They'll shuttle you to a voicemail. The voicemail will have instructions that are two to three minutes long. They'll tell you how to make a scheduling request. Like I said, every congressional office has this and they follow one of three methods. They either give you a email address, they have a web form, or they give you instructions on the voicemail. Sometimes they want the request to come in on letterhead, which means you have to write it out in a Word doc, save it to a PDF and send it as an attachment. So be ready for that. And the reason is maybe you've got a board of directors if you're a nonprofit on your letterhead. Or it also proves that you're a legitimate group. You know, again, every office is a little different, but they generally follow the procedure that Jordan talked about. Now, a common question we get asked and we asked in our scheduler surveys, okay, I placed a request for an elected official to attend and I haven't heard back from them. How long do I wait in order to do a follow-up? And again, that was exactly the question that we asked in a survey of schedulers, generally how quickly does your office take to respond to a request for a meeting with the member of Congress? And believe it or not, imagine, oops, I went a little too fast there, I'm sorry. Um, it's basically two weeks. If you don't hear back in two weeks with that request, here's what you should do. Phone the district office where you may have submitted that request and just tell the front office staff this. I put in the scheduling request a couple of weeks ago. I haven't heard anything, even an acknowledgement that it was received. And I'm just following up to make sure it didn't get lost. Now, trust me, they are not intentionally ignoring you. Um, I have a few rules in life. Um, and one of them is uh, never seek malice in others. Most people offer slights either because they're trying to do too much or they're negligent. First, forgive. I would imagine this community is very much into the forgiving mode. Most of the time, it's an administrative foul. -up. They have a system in place to respond to scheduling requests. So if you don't hear back in two weeks, 
again, it's probably not intentional. I'm not saying that there might be an intentional slight there. Maybe that's the case. Um, but most of the time, it's an administrative goof. So just follow up within two weeks, two and a half weeks, and be very polite about it. And because trust me, the number of people that you goof up in a congressional office, a scheduling request, they're not polite after three or four weeks. They're angry. They're cranky. Um, they're not nice. They're not polite to staff. These are all things that can differentiate yourself, your group, and your request um, from the others. So let's get into a couple of do's and don'ts when it comes to working with uh, a member of Congress. One of the uh, last minute requests, this is something that they do not like is these last minute requests or um, nagging them or requesting a meeting uh, before you have the names and addresses of the local people and the topics you're gonna uh, do. A, an academic study was done a few years ago um, that actually got some attention and I didn't trash it and I probably should have because they made a fatal mistake in the, in the methodology. They made up, first of all, they made up a fictional group, which is like, of course the group never didn't know the group, it doesn't exist. And then they wouldn't give the names of the constituents who they were going to meet with. Those are red flags for, you know, they think, especially today's day and age, they don't know who's going to show up. So if you know the names and, and maybe if you, if you already know the key people, they're going to be participating yourself and others, you know, that's fine. And you can provide the further names if there's going to be additional additions, you know, names that are coming um, later on. One district director said it to me perfectly like this. I've become very wary of groups who won't specify how many people will attend the meeting. So anytime you give off that air of uncertainty to a politician, that staff, that's a warning flag for that staff member. They're not going to say yes to that, that particular group, especially if it's not a group that is known to them. Now, let's talk about deconstructing um, a successful visit. As I said, uh, elected officials always want to get their picture taken with regular people, not wearing a tie in front of a microphone. Because tell me, I was a press secretary for 11 years on Capitol Hill. I had lots of photos of my bosses wearing formal wear or close to it in front of a microphone. I wanted pictures like this, where in this particular case, I think they're at a food bank. Um, or this, where this member of Congress is pretending to intently look at what that woman's showing. And she probably did. Um, actually, I think that was another food bank that we did. So keep in mind, we're going to walk through the steps to creating an effective an event that members of Congress are going to attend. The first step is creating the general idea of what is behind the event. So you're going to visualize what the photo looks like. And if you can get a photo and you're going to have your kids or seniors or animals, and I am not joking, I'm speaking as a professional public relations person. I'm a recovering press secretary on Capitol Hill. And if there was going to be a farm animal, a senior or a kid, and increase the likelihood I was going to send my boss to that event because that makes them look a little more human, a little more fun. You know, I, I did not need more pictures of them with, you know, the Rotary Club. I got a lot of pictures of my bosses with, frankly, old white guys. You know, they wanted diversity. They want a little more about that. And then when you think of what that visual will be, members for staff, they work backwards. They say, okay, that's great. So you've created the idea. And so in this particular case, here's a great example of a member of Congress who's going to an event and it just ended up uh, on their website um, because they thought this was a really cool photo and they thought this was something that they wanted to uh, highlight. So let's reconstruct this photo and what happened here. So this staff got called and we've got here um, a really cool uh, picture right here. What's the focus? Clearly it's on the baby in uh, incubator in a NICU unit um, right there. So this is the photo. So this is what everybody's staring at. You've of course got who's featured from the organization. You know, you got a lady in a smock and a guy in a tie. And when I, by the way, when I was the chief of staff on Capitol Hill, I would always tell my staff members, always listen to people in smocks and hard hats. They're on the front lines. So while Mr. Guy with the tie, I know you're a big muckety muck, you're important as a politician and as a person who's planning the photo, the lady in the smock is more important to me. The people on the front lines are always going to be more important um, to the staff that are making those decisions. Again, they want to get their picture, picture taken with real people. Um, so the next thing you want to think about is how does the event promote or advance the legislator's goals? And one way to identify 
how it might connect to them is by researching the committees that lawmaker is on. If they're on any committee that deals with your issue that you're advocating on behalf of, that's going to be a little bit more of a connection for that legislator. Um, next, identify the process. I talked a little bit about this earlier. Every office has. This is a sample scheduling form that we actually present. As you can see, they're going to be looking for the dates of events or even the times, the contacts name, the description. Are there other VIPs attending? And make a note about other VIPs. When a lawmaker at the state or federal level comes to an event, they want to be the only VIP there. It's not more attractive. Oh, great, Congresswoman. We also got the senator to come. No, don't do that. You got the senator gets their own event. The House member gets their own event. They don't like being upstage. And by the way, House members definitely do not like being upstage by United States senators. It happens all the time. I'm speaking as a former press secretary for a House member and a communications director for a United States senator and consultant to many members of Congress who constantly complain about their senators. Now, I, I, I talked a little bit. Step three is knowing the process when it relates to the schedule. I've already touched on this, but, you know, as I say, this is, again, a very clear way of knowing how that's going to work and when they're going to be available. You may have a process within your organization that you're going to have to go through. Um, mostly not, you probably don't have a lot of bureaucracy involved, but there may be people, others involved. If you're affiliated with a nonprofit and you're getting involved with an elected official, you may have some people on your board um, that are going to want to know about that. They may have a connection. Uh, do your homework on that elected official. Just literally just Google them and find out what they're working on. What are some of the issues that are important to them? And next, you're going to draft the ask. Now, this is the key part of the process where you're putting together on paper what you want this lawmaker to do. So let me walk through a couple of the what I call the magic words, tips for making the ask. And let me just bring everything out here so you can see it in both English and Spanish. So what you're going to want to do here is first include clear logistics. And again, that doesn't mean this time, this date. Give them that window of time. Be specific. If there are a couple topics you want to raise, please include that in the ask. Um, paint a picture if you can. Uh, we're going to be touring this facility between the first half and during that time, we'll have an opportunity to meet a classroom of students who are actually in a class. You get the idea. You're going to give them a little more granular detail on what they want. Include clear contact information, including an email address and a cell phone number, ideally for two people. When that scheduler is going to want follow-up information and they can't get the first person on the phone, they'll call the second person because the chief of staff is bugging them for that information. Um, show your impact in the district. Talk about numbers. We have 300 people in our church. We have 400 people that are volunteers for the nonprofit. Use those numbers. And then finally, utilize multiple communications via various avenues. Uh, I do a lot of work with food banks. And what's interesting about food banks is on one level, they're serving, frankly, the most needy community uh, in their uh, in their towns and villages and counties. But they often have people on their boards of directors that are, frankly, the most wealthy and, the, frankly, the, the pillars of the community. So when I encourage people in a nonprofit, I say, if you put the scheduling request in as an executive director or as a pastor, and then can have you know someone else who's affiliated, like a volunteer or a member of your church or a member of your organization, also send it in around the same time saying, I know that you've been invited to Second Harvest of Kansas City. I just wanted to let you know I'm a volunteer for this, and I would love to be able to attend. Do you think you might be able to positively respond to that inquiry? So said another way, when a politician can say once and make two people happy, that's good math for the politician. And so that's what they're going to want to do. So keep that in mind. And then as we talked about, follow up with the ask. Um, be persistent. You know, you want to be as uh, uh, patient as well, and also be flexible, as I've said. Um, persistence can grind down an iron beam into a needle. Now, I'm not saying being annoying. Um, I remember throwing a, a focus group with some chiefs of staff some years ago, and I asked them, well, who do you listen to? And he said, well, I have to admit it, but I listen to the squeaky wheels. And again, not the people that are writing three times a day with their crayon in the margin of the letters. That's what I'm talking about. But as I said, polite follow-up a couple weeks later is perfectly normal and expected in a congressional office. Okay, let's 
Now, lastly, settle on the details. I've talked to, to mention that. Um, focusing on the big picture, but don't forget the tiny details. Um, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the complete picture of what this event is going to look for. All right, once again, I just want to remind you, you can go ahead and ask questions in the chat box. I'd be happy to answer any. We're going into the final stretch of today's presentation. And I'd be, again, happy to take any questions that people have about the details of that. But let's just talk a little bit about the comprehensive uh, checklist for a minute. Now, we're going to provide this to you in a handout form. Um, it's not quite ready because um, we really do need to translate it. Um, and I haven't gotten that yet to um, Hispanic Access Foundation, but I will be getting them this, this checklist. And I'm not going to go over the complete checklist because it's meant to be comprehensive. It's not something that you need to have uh, available immediately. But this is all the complete different, you'd be thinking about the logistics and whether you're going to you know, need uh, other materials that are available. Are you going to be doing invitations? Um, how is this going to work? Um, what are the contact information? What's going to be the total crowd? Do you have to have food involved? Um, these are all things that are, again, you don't have to have in every event. The reason we call it comprehensive is that we hope that you might consider some of these things. And then thinking about the run of show. Now, this doesn't have to be choreographed to the minute in general, but an elected official is going to want to know in general, what am I going to spend my first 15 minutes doing? When am I going to take questions from an audience or other people? If it's just a regular meeting that you're requesting in the district office or state office, then you don't need a run of show. But if you're doing something that's going to be a little more staged, where you're going to have some people presenting information to that lawmaker, well, that's a little different. Then you are going to probably want a run of show in a little more detail. And then finally, are you going to invite the media? Do not, I repeat, do not surprise the politician by having reporters there and not notify the office in advance. That is a big broken rule. Don't do that. Let them know. Now, and ask their permission. They may want rest there. That's great. And when media get requests from both a elected official and from a group coming at the same time, I'm speaking as a former press secretary, that's gonna increase the likelihood that local media is going to cover that event. And that's gold, folks. I mean, that's what you really want. Now, when you're thinking about, again, a more complicated event, you might need to think about some other details related to it. And when I say backdrop here, um, and, and you know, do you need lighting? And obviously you probably don't, but this is a more complicated event. But again, that's why we're calling this um, comprehensive. It's like, you're not gonna perhaps need all of these things, but just, just keep that in mind if you are gonna be inviting people. And then think about follow-up before the event. And what I mean follow-up is like, are you going to share the good news on social media? Okay, well, if we're going to share the good news on social media, we're going to have to plan for a photo op at the event. If we're going to plan for a photo op. Who's going to be in the photo or the photos of the event? See how you're planning backwards, even though you're already thinking about the follow-up. And so they're always going to be thinking about those, those photographs and what that's going to, to look like. Um, like this one right here. Um, this worked out for um, now Governor Hochul. Um, and for women, you know, you can pass okay in a, in a hairnet. I did a bubblegum event with my boss. Guys, don't plan an event just telling you where the member of Congress because a man has to wear a hairnet. So just in general, no hairnets. Hard hats are really good. Outdoor events with construction, with mountains in the background, really good. Again, where the politician doesn't have to wear a tie. And then finally, if you have a successful event or even a successful meeting with the elected official, I strongly encourage you to write a letter to the editor. I, I worked on Capitol Hill for 13 years. I never got a thank you note in a letter to the editor. I would have killed for this. This is awesome. And again, most politicians are going to favor or think that a letter to the editor is actually more influential than an editorial. Because editorials, many newspapers have ideological bents or positions, whereas a letter to the editor has a level of authenticity to it that's really quite powerful. So um, with that, I'll just give you one final go to questions here, and I'm going to actually turn off the um, uh, the screen here for a second if I can get my uh, captioning working here. But typical... There we go. That's always my last phrase. But let me see. Let me see if, can, if I can get my my Zoom to take this off. So go ahead 
and ask any questions you would like. There we go. Screen sharing is stopped. Okay, so feel free to ask any question at this point. You can put it into the Q&A or into the chat. Um, and if I hear from none of you, that means that everybody at the Hispanic Access Foundation thinks you're all ready to plan your event, which probably not. Uh, but still, um, feel free to ask any questions you want to help you clarify any of the data that I've passed on so far. No questions there, and I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, Thank you, whoever M is, to everyone. <laughs> um, it's been amazing. I've thought so too. Uh, so let me answer, uh, let me give you a couple answers to questions that I've, I've gotten in the past about this. Um, what about controversial topics? Many of you are working on issues related to immigration. And how do you make a topic like immigration a little less controversial for, let's say, a Republican to attend? Well, first and foremost, I'd say, um, don't make it public. You know, this is where a meeting in the district office is probably better than an event. Um, bring people that are constituents. They're going to have a story to tell. Um, if you make it easy like that, where they want to come in and talk to the member of Congress. And again, you might not get the member. You might end up meeting with the district director or state director. That's fine. Building those relationships, as I've said in some of these other programs, with those state staff, state staff turn into champions. You know, they want to sometimes look for solutions with you. So feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, what do you do for last minute events just to introduce your organization to top priority? What are some good follow up questions to ask representatives to show interest in their priorities? Well, Jazari, first of all, I love that you started with showing interest in their priorities. Most groups and people don't do that. So just um, reaching out and understanding and doing research in advance is really important. As I noted earlier, they don't really like last minute events. Um, and none of us do, right? We have a schedule, we have a set plan, we're doing something here or there. So it doesn't really work with last minute event unless there's something that's happened. You know, I mean, look at what happened with the uh, pipeline or the um, tanker uh, train explosion in, um, ten in Ohio, you know, we didn't, you know, those politicians didn't know they were going to be doing that, but they had to do it, right? So sometimes there's tragedies that happen or accidents that happen that they're going to respond to. But by and large, garden variety events and questions, they're going to, you know, or, 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 or meetings are going to be just, you know, again, three to four weeks out. That's pretty much what you want to do. Okay. Um, with that, I'm going to give you back, folks, a few minutes of your time. For those of you, if anybody's going to be in Washington for our presentation tomorrow, looking forward to meeting y'all in Washington, D.C. And I also, frankly, um, really want to express my gratitude for the work that you all do. Uh, I know that it is really difficult work, and I also know that sometimes it can be challenging and intimidating to work with elected officials and the communities that you're serving. Frankly, in your view, may not be the most important to them, but you can change that. You can tell them, and you can that they do have a voice with elected officials, and you can be their voice if you choose to engage in advocacy. And if you listen to Mr. Jefferson's words that we in America do not have a government by the majority, we have a government by the majority who participate. So go forth and participate and good luck with your advocacy efforts. Thank you, everybody.